Hi, it's Robin from 8-Bit Show and Tell. Happy New Year to you from both me and from my Commodore Pet 4032. Doing a little smooth scrolling here. This is a program I wrote uh, 10 or more years ago. And uh, I just update it whenever, whenever I remember to. And also, welcome to all of you new subscribers. Uh, I have to say thank you to Glenn on Reddit for sharing a couple of my videos, and also uh, to Bill Hurd, the lead designer of the Commodore 128, who also shared some of my videos on Facebook. Within a couple days, Reddit, Facebook, uh, I think my subscriber count doubled uh, in a very short time there. So thank you to them, and thank you to you uh, for the interest. So today I was planning on doing an explanation of my snowflake generating program that I had shown you last time, just as it was just like an amusement, but a lot of people were asking about it. But I was looking over the source code to it, and there was one part that I was really, uh, I was unhappy with because I didn't fully understand what I was doing. I was thinking, I can't explain it to you if I don't even know what I'm doing in this spot. So just show you that. I've got my super snapshot cartridge here again. I'm just going to go into the monitor. I'll just show you the spot in it. It's down here somewhere. Of course, this isn't the source code. This is a disassembly, but I'm just going to show you here. Uh, right here, I am loading a value from the SID. This is the uh, so-called random number generator in the SID. And we'll be looking at this... Uh, more later. I'll explain it more later. But anyway, I'm loading a value, storing it. This is in my sprite. And then I've got a bunch of these nops here. That's a no operation. And all it does is it wastes, essentially it wastes two cycles. You have basically about a million cycles per second. Each one of these wastes two. When I was programming this, I was realizing that I wasn't getting enough randomness, or that is, I was getting the same number multiple times in a row now, without fully understanding why, I added a bunch of these no operations to delay a little bit before looping back and reading another value here, and that solved the problem. And I, I moved on, because I want to get the program done, uh, without looking into it too much. But I want to understand better why I had to add these delays, and am I adding the correct number of delays? Maybe I'm adding too many and it's a waste. So I'd like to understand that better. So that's what we're going to be looking at today. Okay, back to the snowflakes here. So like I was saying, the, some people say the SID has a random number generator in it. Uh, well, it, it does, but what it actually, its purpose is a noise waveform. You can select different sound uh, shapes, different waveforms for each of the voices in the SID. And there's the uh, triangle and what sawtooth and uh, pulse. And there's also the noise, which just sounds like an explosion or like wind. And the way they created that was with, uh, apparently, some, some of the guys have figured out it's a 23-bit LFSR, linear feedback shift registers, or something I just absolutely love. Uh, when I discovered that they are actually the magic behind, uh, for example, Pitfall, when David Crane programmed Pitfall for the Atari 2600, he only had four kilobytes to write that whole game. And part of how he did it, how he generated 256 different screens in that game and still fit it into 4K, was using a linear feedback shift register. And the seemingly infinite scrolling world of River Raid by Carol Shaw also used a LFSR. After I learned that, I used LFSRs in my own games on the Commodore 64. But well, I, I'd actually like to do an episode about that, but we'll get into that another time. Just to explain uh, a little bit about what's going on. Oh, cancel those snowflakes. That's enough of that. You can actually read the output of oscillator 3. Oscillator 1 and 2 aren't uh, exposed in a way that you can read them programmatically. Uh, you can only hear their output, but you can't actually just read the SID and get a value out of it. But you can 
for oscillator 3. And all you have to do is peak 54299 and you get a value back. You see I'm getting random numbers here right now and that's because of my snowflake routine. So I'm going to use the reset switch here and reset the computer and do that peak again, 54299, and I get the value zero back. So you see it's just returning zeros currently after I've reset the computer. And what I need to do to get those numbers changing again, it's as simple, it's, it's three pokes, 54286, comma 255, then also 54287. And what that does is sets the frequency of oscillator 3 to the maximum. 255, 255 in both registers is 655, 35. It's, it's the maximum 16-bit value. It's FFFF in hexadecimal. So that's as fast as it'll go. And now you don't have to do that to get random numbers out, but the faster or the higher the frequency of the oscillator, the quicker those random numbers will come. So that's why we set it to the maximum. But that alone isn't enough to get this working. You see up here we're still getting a zero returned. So we also have to poke 54290, comma 128. And that tells oscillator 3 to start generating the random waveform to use the random waveform. So I poke that and I'll go up here and peek. There, and now we're getting random numbers back. Every time I hit enter, oh, well, that's, that's printing over the old value. 126, 125, 168, and so on. These random numbers are being generated plenty fast enough for basic. You're not going to get the same number twice in a row. Well, maybe you are because but it'll be the same number a second time or third or fourth time. Oscillator is constantly pumping out these so-called random numbers. Really, it's a, a fixed pattern generated by this linear feedback shift register. We can peak them. Now, when you're writing an assembly language program or a machine language program like my Snowflake routine, it's so fast that the number actually doesn't change in time. So in a very tight loop, I think my program's still in memory. Yep, there it is. So if we had a very tight loop here, like load a D41B, that's that same value we're just peaking, 54299 in decimal, and we stored it, and we immediately branched back here, we would get the same number multiple times in a row. So what I'm wondering is, how many cycles are there at the maximum frequency? How many cycles does it stay the same value? If only there was a way of very quickly pulling that location and then be able to count how many cycles does the value stay the same. And there is, it's called a RAM expansion unit, an REU. And this one here is the model 1700. This was made by Commodore and released about the same time as the Commodore 128. And this holds 128 kilobytes of RAM. And then here is the 1764 unit. And this is one that was intended for the Commodore 64 and it contains 256 kilobytes. But really, uh, all these are interchangeable. Most important thing about to note about this one is, well, if you're using any of these RAM expansion units on a Commodore 64, that you should have a better, a beefier power supply. And actually, they included one when you bought this. With a Commodore 64, you also got a heavy-duty power supply included. And finally, the 1750 RAM expansion, and this contains 512 kilobytes, and that's the largest one that was made by Commodore. So these are all official Commodore products. This one, some of them have yellowed more than others. Which I'm going to turn off 128 here so I can show you. And I've got this one here. This is a CMD 1750 512K REU. This is by 
uh, CMD who famously made Jiffy DOS and the Super CPU and a bunch of other devices. And you'll see, if I put them beside each other, how much smaller the CMD 1750 is. Now apparently CMD somehow ended up with a bunch of the REC chips, which is the custom chip that drives these devices made by Commodore, but there's like a surplus that were never used. So CMD uh, made use of them in their own cartridge. And this is the one I typically use now, partly just because of its size. This big thing is pretty awkward to use in my expansion unit. This is my CMD uh, EX3 cartridge port expander that I showed you recently. But you see here, 1750 is a nice fit. What's the word we're looking for here? There. <laughs> Extremely ungainly. I think it is in there secure enough, but just seems pretty risky to me. That's the number one reason why I don't use it. And I've also heard that the 1750 uses less power. It must have a lot less RAM chips in it. I've never opened one of these up to find out uh, exactly what's in there, but uh, this is very likely strains the power supply less as well. So that's a good reason to use it. Now, of course, these RAM expansion units weren't made to scan your SID chip or whatever I'm suggesting we use it for today. Its main purpose was to expand the memory available in your computer, especially the Commodore 128. They wanted it to seem more professional. And uh, part of that was adding a lot of extra RAM. But Commodore went about in a strange way. Instead of making the RAM accessible to the CPU or built into the computer, it was sold in an add-on cartridge. But the CPU cannot read these directly. The RAM in here is not available to the CPU. All that's available to the CPU is the included REC chip that I was mentioning, which is a programmable DMA chip. And you set it up to transfer memory from the computer into the REU or the other direction around, or even to do a swap. You tell it the, the source and the destination addresses and what type of transfer you want to do, and it does it. This makes it kind of confusing and inaccessible, but it's also extremely powerful. It does it through DMA, and it actually transfers a whole byte every machine cycle. That means it transfers a whole megabyte every second, which is an incredible speed for an old 8-bit computer like this. And it has some other features in it, which are really neat to play around with. And while we're talking about RAM expansions, I'm just going to mention this quickly. The BBG RAM, this actually has two megabytes of RAM in it. And it's very similar in function, or I think it's exactly compatible with the Geo RAM that was sold as a RAM expansion for the Geos operating system for the 64. This is different. This does not contain an REC chip. It does not contain a DMA function at all. Instead, the memory is very simply paged into the I.O. space of the C64 or 128, and the CPU can read this directly, but it can only see one 256-byte page at a time and it's much slower to access. So it's simpler to operate. It was simpler and cheaper to construct for them to produce these, but the downside is it's not nearly as fast or powerful as an REU. And by the way, I just I did want to mention that the REU is emulated in Vice. So even if you don't own an REU, you can still play around with one in Vice. And so today I'm going to be using my my well <laughs> my well loved my beat up Super Snapshot version five. I think last episode I said that really there's very little difference between this and the more popular action replay that was used. The Super Snapshot does have one big advantage. It's compatible with the REU. You can use them together, and that's something that the action replay could not do. Uh, I believe later versions like the Retro Replay is compatible with the REU. I've never used it myself, but back here in the late 80s and early 90s, this may have been the only utility cartridge compatible with the REU. So it's great to experiment with. As I was mentioning before, the EX3 allows you to have multiple cartridges 
So I've got the two of them here together and I'm going to plug them in, into the back of my C128. And just a note about the EX3 cartridge port expander. Uh, they're not made anymore, but uh, I see that Jim Brain makes one uh, through his website, goforretro.com. It's called the Xpander Expander 3. And uh, for 30, it seems like it's just $30 US. I think it might even have a few new features. Okay, so before we get to the REU programming, today's new 8-bit stuff segment, I just want to highlight this game, Sam's Journey, which is just over a year old now. It's an amazing technical achievement for the C64. And it was originally only a PAL release, just a European release. And that was controversial because, of course, people here in North America wanted to play it. I'm in Canada, uh, as I've mentioned before. They went about making an NTSC version. But then, even more controversially, they said that would require a RAM expansion unit. And uh, that really got a lot of discussion going online. Uh, a lot of people saying, well, why, why are they needing extra RAM? What does that have to do with it? Or... Why don't they just optimize more or whatever? Well, I think it was, I, I totally understand why they did it. So when people suggested that this game should just be optimized better to run on NTSC, anybody who can pull off this amazing game, they, they have already optimized this game to the hilt. So the fundamental problem in the PAL NTSC divide is that PAL programs only need to generate 50 frames a second to have smooth animation, while NTSC has to generate 60 frames a second. So if you're already using more or less 100% of your CPU time in generating the game at 50 frames a second, you simply cannot show 60 frames per second without dropping something well unless there is optimization but you have to trust these guys <laughs> they know that there was there wasn't any more optimization to do so they could have like i don't know dropped scrolling the color or something pretty horrible so instead what they did was by requiring the reu they used that dma function i was talking about that can very quickly copy bytes from one location to another and by doing that they were able to offload Instead of requiring the CPU to scroll the screen, the REU did it at a much faster speed. And that was enough for them to get the extra 10 frames per second required by NTSC hardware. Okay, so that's Sam's journey. Back here, I'm going to go into my Super Snapshot monitor. There's this option, star R0 in the monitor allows you to look at the memory in the REU bank one. The REU memory is organized into banks of 64K. The smallest REU, the 1700, had two banks of 64K for 128K and so on, up to a maximum of eight banks. Uh, CMD actually produced a two megabyte 1750XL, which had another, uh, well, four times the banks, so with that 32 banks of 64K. I don't have one of those. But we can look at, at memory in the REU here, and it's full of stuff. Well, I'm almost certain that this is the scrolling memory that Sam's journey used when it was blitting, you know, copying that memory around quickly. And you see here, basically it was just using 1k worth, I think, because all this doesn't look like screen memory anymore. It's just kind of filled with garbage. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to fill that RAM. So we're going to fill bank zero's RAM from zero to the maximum this is the full 64k limit with a byte like bb is one that 
the Super Snapshot uses. So that's going to take a few seconds. Okay. By the way, F1 is a shortcut down to the bottom left corner of the screen, which is very handy for a lot of these scrolling commands. Now you can see that memory has been filled with BB. And you just use star by itself to go back to C64 RAM, and we can see, uh, yeah, this is obviously C64 RAM, these two locations, 0 and 1, are commonly that. Okay, so we're going to write a little REU program to transfer memory over. I'm going to show you how, back to that SID problem, sampling the SID. So we're going to assemble the location C1000, load A with 1B, and that's the low byte of address in the SID. And we're going to store that in DF02, which is the low byte in the computer that we're going to transfer data from, that we're going to copy from. And then we're going to load A with D4 and store that in DF03. Okay, so the address we're going to be pulling from the Commodore 64 memory, or from the I.O. space, D41B, this is that oscillator 3 output from the SID. And we're telling the REU that this is the location to copy from. Okay, and then we're going to load a 0 into the A register, and then we're going to store that in DF04 which is the destination in the RAM expansion unit, DF04 and DF05. Those are the low and high bytes of the destination. We just want it to go right at the beginning of bank of the bank, and that bank is going to be zero. So conveniently, we don't have to reload the A register. So DF06 is the bank number. You can just think of it as a 24-bit address where this is the low byte, this is sort of the medium, the middle byte, and this is the high byte or the bank number of a 24-bit address in the RAM of the RU. The next two bytes are the length of the transfer, DF07, and we're just going to put a zero there and in DF08. If you put a zero in DF07 and DF08, that's actually a maximum 64K transfer, 65,536 bytes. If you want a smaller number, then you would store, uh, well, a different value, the low and high byte. For example, if you wanted 256 bytes worth, uh, you would put a zero in this location and a one in this one, and that would equal 256 bytes. Now we're going to load A with the value of 80 and store that in DFOA. And this is called the address control register. And basically the high two bits, if they are a 1-0, then that means we're going to fix the C64 address to just that one location. The default, if you put a zero in here, is that both locations are incremented. So that's if you want to do a block of memory from the C64 into a block in the RU or the other way around, and you want to keep incrementing the source and destination by one byte, then you would just store a zero in this location. But what we actually want to do is just keep repeatedly reading location D41B, but storing that in the bank of the REU memory 64K samples. So basically we're going to be reading one location in the C64, that is the oscillator 3 of the SID, but making 65,000 copies of that location so we can watch it change over time, cycle by cycle, because the REU is going to be copying one byte every cycle. Okay, and next, this might not be totally necessary, but for our purposes, it's pretty important. We're going to load DO11, which is a VIC control register, video register. We're going to load whatever's in there, 
and that with EF, which masks out bit 4, sets bit 4 to 0, and then we're going to store it back in that same register. So basically we've just made ensured that this bit is turned off. And bit 4 of DO11 disables the screen output. What it does is, is it disables the bad lines and the graphic fetches that the VIC makes. This could be a whole other episode. The video chip in the C64, or, or the 128 and 40 column mode, fetches its graphic data from C64 RAM in one half. There's like two phases per one megahertz cycle, but sometimes the VIC needs more data than it can get. So it triggers what's called a bad line, and basically it just stuns the CPU. It stops the CPU from operating, and the VIC fetches extra data on those cycles. So it does that at the beginning of every scan line, so it can fetch enough data, and some other cases. What happens is that also takes priority over the DMA transfers, and we're going to miss out on some of the cycles, at kind of an irregular pattern, probably. So it's best to turn off the screen during this experiment, so that we know that the DMA, the REU, is going to be fetching every single cycle, and won't be interrupted by the VIC. Okay, and we're almost done here. We're going to load 90 and store that in DF01. Okay, and this value of 90 in hex, bit 7 tells the REU to execute. Bit 7 has a value of 80, and bit 4 has a value of 10, so you add those together and you get 90 hex. Bit 4 actually tells the command register to disable FF00 decode, and we want that disabled. What FF0 decode does is if you just stored an 80 in here, the REU would not begin its transfer right away. It would actually wait until you stored to location FF00, and then it would begin. And the reason they added that is because if you want to do a DMA under IO space, that is in this D1000 range where the VIC and the REU and all sorts of other things live, you wouldn't be able to do that if it wasn't for this FF00. What this actually lets you do is set up your transfer command, and then you can bank out IO space and put RAM in its place with location 1 or location 0 and 1, and then you can trigger the DMA with the correct C64 memory configuration that you that you want. So it's just a way of delaying the write. Anyway, we don't need that today. So that's why we are going to put 90 there. Okay. Then finally, we're just going to turn the screen back on. Load it, and we're going to OR it with, uh, whoops, value 10, and then store that in, DO11. And our routine is finally done. They can see why a lot of people don't get into programming this, because I guess it is confusing. <laughs> but you just work through it methodically. Everything makes sense, I think, once you understand what it's for. That's what I'm hoping to do here, is make people understand uh, that the REU is quite an interesting device and quite a quite capable device, too. Okay, so we're done all that. I'm back in BASIC. And I just have to remember here to re-enable, because we've reset the computer since, we're just going to re-enable oscillator 3 so it's producing random numbers again for this experiment. 54290, 128. Okay, and now we should be able to peak 54299 just to verify that we're getting random numbers out of it again. Yep. Okay. And now we're just going to execute that code we just typed in at location C1000, which is 49152 decimal. There, the screen flashed, and we should have collected, that quickly, 65,536 samples of oscillator 3 from the SID. Let's go back into the monitor and check it out. We're going to go into R0, and you remember that we filled this with BBs. Let's take a look in here. Whoops. Memory zero. There, there we go. Now we're filled with numbers, and there's definitely a pattern going on here. 
So here in the bank we have 32, and we have 16 of them. And then the next round number, remember this is hex, the next number is 62, and we have 16 of them. And 21, 16 of them, and so on. It looks like there are always 16 random numbers. Let's see. Just going to keep scrolling through memory here. Yeah, it looks, there's a bunch of 1s, the 9Bs, 4Bs. Yep. So let's keep scrolling through here. So basically it seems that the random number, the oscillator 3, changes every 16 cycles while on the 17th cycle it will change again six. so here we've only scrolled through 1000 hacks values that's 4096 to e just gonna keep scrolling here We'll skip ahead to halfway through. Ah, okay. So it looks like it's off by one now. Everything's one. Instead of having the values being uh, exactly aligned, they're offset by one. So it seems to me that it's probably not every 16 cycles exactly probably something wraps around and occasionally there are 17 in a row. Do we want to find it? I guess we want to find when that happened, don't we? Okay, so we'll look at 2,000. Those are still page aligned. 3,000. No, I'm sorry, not page aligned. Uh, <laughs> I don't have a... I need a word for that, but anyway. It's lined up. This is. I think it's just coincidence that we got it so pretty here. 4,000. Okay, so it's happened somewhere in here. 3,800, whoops. Oh, it's offset there even. Memory, 3,400. It's offset there. Memory, 3,200. There. Four, four. Okay, so this 7e, here it is. This one has 17, and that goes back to having 16. So the 20, there's 17 20s, and then we're back to 16 99s. All right, I wonder, so if that's at value, 3360 is the beginning of 17 byte sequence and so i wonder if we can find another 17 byte sequence in here so 5000 still offset by one 6000 is offset by one still 7000 is offset by one 8000 9000 Still just by one. A thousand. B thousand. Still by one. C thousand. Still by one. D thousand. Still by one. E thousand. And F thousand. And let's go right to the bottom of the bank. Still by one. So it seems maybe once every bank every 65,536 samples or greater it there is a occurrence of of a sequence that is 17 bytes long a repeating sequence so probably there's some math we can do with the sid i don't think i understand exactly how the sid oscillators work well enough but i have the idea that that frequency is just added to a counter and every so often it wraps around and produces maybe one extra cycle like this. 
Uh, that's something we can dig into in a future episode, or maybe somebody watching already understands that and they can explain that. Okay, so to get back to my original question, now that we know it's 16 and very occasionally 17 cycles that the random numbers repeat at, at the maximum frequency, we can take a look back at my Snowflake program. And if load A takes 4, the store takes 4, the decrease down here takes 2, and the branch of plus takes 3, that is 8, 10, 13 cycles. And then, so basically we only need 3 or 4. So really, I only need 2 knops here, and I'll get rid of the repeating bytes. Actually, you know what? I'm going to see if we can make the bug occur just quickly. I'm going to fix this properly when we actually go through this snowflake routine in another episode. But what I want to do here is just go decrease x and branch shift plus to CO71 and assemble CO81 nop nop nop. Okay, so just to show you what I've done here is I've reworked the routine just with the built-in monitor here to load the value, to store it, to decrease X and branch. So now it's a tight little loop and all the knops are occurring after the loop is done. So let's give that a try. Restart the snowflakes. Oh, that's a really nice one there. <laughs> okay, that's it for another episode. If you haven't already, please subscribe and hit that little bell notification so that you know when I upload a new episode. I've got lots of other episodes planned here, uh, including a, a proper breakdown of this Snowflake routine uh, and some other uses of the RU. I've got games uh, that I have patched and modified. Uh, Easter eggs that have never been discovered, I think. I'm the first one to discover some of these Easter eggs. So there's all kinds of things to go through. So thanks a lot. Once again, Happy New Year, and we'll see you next time. Yeah.